Chapter One of the Alhambra: A Series of Tales and Sketches of the Moors and Spaniards by Washington Irving. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter One: The Journey. In the spring of eighteen twenty nine, the author of this work, whom curiosity had brought into Spain, made a rambling expedition from Seville to Granada in company with a friend a member of the russian embassy at madrid accident had thrown us together from distant regions of the globe and a similarity of taste led us to wander together among the romantic mountains of andalusia should these pages meet his eye wherever thrown by the duties of his station whether mingling in the pageantry of courts or meditating on the truer glories of nature may they recall the scenes of our adventurous companionship, and with them the remembrance of one in whom neither time nor distance will obliterate the recollection of his gentleness and worth. And here, before setting forth, let me indulge in a few previous remarks on Spanish scenery and Spanish travelling. Many are apt to picture Spain in their imaginations as a soft southern region decked out with all the luxuriant charms of voluptuous Italy. On the contrary, though there are exceptions in some of the maritime provinces, yet for the greater part it is a stern, melancholy country, with rugged mountains and long, naked, sweeping plains, destitute of trees, and invariably silent and lonesome, partaking of the savage and solitary character of Africa. What adds to this silence and loneliness is the absence of singing birds, a natural consequence of the want of groves and hedges. The vulture and the eagle are seen wheeling above the mountain cliffs and soaring over the plains, and groups of shy bustards stalk about the heath, but the myriads of smaller birds which animate the whole face of other countries are met with in but few provinces of Spain, and in them chiefly among the orchards and gardens which surround the habitations of man. In the exterior provinces the traveller occasionally traverses great tracts cultivated with grain as far as the eye can reach, waving at times with verdure, at other times naked and sunburnt. But he looks round in vain for the hand that has tilled the soil. At length he perceives some village perched on a steep hill or rugged crag, with mouldering battlements and ruined watch-tower, a stronghold in old times against civil war or Moorish inroad, for the custom among the peasantry of congregating together for mutual protection is still kept up in most parts of Spain in consequence of the marauding of roving freebooters. But though a great part of Spain is deficient in the garniture of groves and forests and the softer charms of ornamental cultivation, yet its scenery has something of a high and lofty character to compensate the want. It partakes something of the attributes of its people, and I think that I better understand the proud, hardy, frugal, and abstemious Spaniard, his manly defiance of hardships and contempt of effeminate indulgences, since I have seen the country he inhabits. There is something, too, in the sternly simple features of the Spanish landscape that impresses on the soul a feeling of sublimity. The immense plains of the Castiles and La Mancha, extending as far as the eye can reach, derive an interest from their very nakedness and immensity, and have something of the solemn grandeur of the ocean. In ranging over these boundless wastes, the eye catches sight, here and there, of a straggling herd of cattle attended by a lonely herdsman, motionless as a statue, with his long slender pike tapering up like a lance into the air, or beholds a long train of mules slowly moving along the waste like a train of camels in the desert, or a single herdsman armed with blunderbust and stiletto and prowling over the plain. 
thus the country the habits the very looks of the people have something of the arabian character the general insecurity of the country is evinced in the universal use of weapons the herdsman in the field the shepherd in the plain has his musket and his knife the wealthy villager rarely ventures to the market town without his trabuco and perhaps a servant on foot with a blunderbuss on his shoulder and the most petty journey is undertaken with the preparations of a warlike enterprise the dangers of the road produce also a mode of travelling resembling on a diminutive scale the caravans of the east the arrieros or carriers congregate in troops and set off in large and well-armed trains on appointed days while individual travellers swell their number and contribute to their strength in this primitive way is the commerce of the country carried on the muleteer is the general medium of traffic and the legitimate wanderer of the land traversing the peninsula from the pyrenees and the asturias to the alpejaras the serrania de ronda and even to the gates of gibraltar he lives frugally and hardily his alforjas or saddle-bags of coarse cloth hold his scanty stock of provisions a leathern bottle hanging at his saddle-bow contains wine or water for a supply across barren mountains and thirsty plains a mule-cloth spread upon the ground is his bed at night and his pack-saddle is his pillow his low but clear-limbed and sinewy form betokens strength his complexion is dark and sunburnt his eye resolute but quiet in its expression except when kindled by sudden emotion his demeanour is frank manly and courteous and he never passes you without a grave salutation dios garda a usted vai usted con dios caballero god guard you god be with you cavalier as these men have often their whole fortune at stake upon the burden of their mules they have their weapons at hand slung to their saddles and ready to be snatched down for desperate defence but their united numbers render them secure against petty bands of marauders and the solitary bandolero armed to the teeth and mounted on his andalusian steed hovers about them like a pirate about a merchant convoy without daring to make an assault the spanish muleteer has an inexhaustible stock of songs and ballads with which to beguile his incessant wayfaring the airs are rude and simple consisting of but few inflections these he chants forth with a loud voice and long drawling cadence seated sideways on his mule who seems to listen with infinite gravity and to keep time with his paces to the tune the couplets thus chanted are often old traditional romances about the moors or some legend of a saint or some love ditty or what is still more frequent some ballad about a bold contrabandista or hardy bandolero for the smuggler and the robber are poetical heroes among the common people of spain often the song of the muleteer is composed at the instant and relates to some local scene or some incident of the journey this talent of singing and improvising is frequent in spain and is said to have been inherited from the moors there is something wildly pleasing in listening to these ditties among the rude and lonely scenes they illustrate accompanied as they are by the occasional jingle of the mule bell it has a most picturesque effect also to meet a train of muleteers in some mountain pass first you hear the bells of the leading mules breaking with their simple melody the stillness of the airy height or perhaps the voice of the muleteer admonishing some tardy or wandering animal or chanting at the full stretch of his lungs 
some traditionary ballad. At length you see the mules slowly winding along the cragged defile, sometimes descending precipitous cliffs, so as to present themselves in full relief against the sky, sometimes toiling up the deep arid chasms below you. As they approach, you descry their gay decorations of worsted tufts, tassels, and saddle-cloths, while, as they pass by, the ever-ready trabuco, slung behind their packs and saddles, gives a hint of the insecurity of the road. The ancient kingdom of Granada, into which we are about to penetrate, is one of the most mountainous regions of Spain. Vast sierras or chains of mountains, destitute of shrub or tree, and mottled with variegated marbles and granites, elevate their sunburnt summits against a deep blue sky, yet in their rugged bosoms lie engulfed the most verdant and fertile valley, where the desert and the garden strive for mastery, and the very rock, as it were, compelled to yield the fig, the orange, and the citron, and to blossom with the myrtle and the rose. In the wild passes of these mountains, the sight of walled towns and villages built like eagles' nests among the cliffs and surrounded by Moorish battlements, or of ruined watch-towers perched on lofty peaks, carry the mind back to the chivalrous days of Christian and Moslem warfare, and to the romantic struggle for the conquest of Granada. In traversing their lofty sierras, the traveller is often obliged to alight and lead his horse up and down the steep and jagged ascents and descents, resembling the broken steps of a staircase. Sometimes the road winds along dizzy precipices, without parapet to guard him from the gulfs below, and then will plunge down steep and dark and dangerous declivities. Sometimes it struggles through rugged barrancos or ravines worn by water torrents, the obscure pass of the contrabandista, while ever and anon the ominous cross, the memento of robbery and murder, erected on a mound of stones at some lonely part of the road, admonishes the traveller that he is among the haunts of banditti, perhaps at that very moment under the eye of some lurking bandolero. Sometimes, in winding through the narrow valleys, he is startled by a horse bellowing, and beholds above him, on some green fold of the mountainside, a herd of fierce Andalusian bulls, destined for the combat of the arena. There is something awful in the contemplation of these terrific animals, clothed with tremendous strength, and ranging their native pastures in untamed wildness, strangers almost to the face of man. They know no one but the solitary herdsman who attends upon them, and even he at times dares not venture to approach them. The low bellowings of these bulls, and their menacing aspect as they look down from their rocky height, give additional wildness to the savage scenery around. I have been betrayed unconsciously into a longer disquisition than I had intended on the several features of Spanish travelling, but there is a romance about all the recollections of the peninsula that is dear to the imagination. It was on the first of May that my companion and myself set forth from Sevilla on our route to Granada. We had made all due preparations for the nature of our journey, which lay through mountainous regions where the roads are little better than mere mule-paths, and too frequently beset by robbers. The most valuable part of our luggage had been forwarded by the arrieros. We retained merely clothing and necessaries for the journey, and money for the expenses of the road, with a sufficient surplus of the latter, to satisfy the expectations of robbers should we be assailed, and to save ourselves from the rough treatment that awaits the too wary and empty-handed traveller. A couple of stout hired steeds were provided for ourselves, and a third for our scanty luggage, 
and for the conveyance of a sturdy Biscayan lad of about twenty years of age, who was to guide us through the perplexed mazes of the mountain roads, to take care of our horses, to act occasionally as our valet, and at all times as our guard, for he had a formidable trabuco, or carbine, to defend us from rateros, or solitary footpads, about which weapon he made much vainglorious boast, though to the discredit of his generalship I must say that it generally hung unloaded behind his saddle. He was, however, a faithful, cheery, kind-hearted creature, full of saws and proverbs as that miracle of squires, the renowned Sancho himself, whose name we bestowed upon him, and, like a true Spaniard, though treated by us with companionable familiarity, he never for a moment in his utmost hilarity overstepped the bounds of respectful decorum. Thus equipped and attended, we set out on our journey with a genuine disposition to be pleased. With such a disposition, what a country is Spain for a traveller, where the most miserable inn is as full of adventure as an enchanted castle, and every meal is in itself an achievement. Let others repine at the lack of turnpike roads and sumptuous hotels and all the elaborate comforts of a country cultivated into tameness and commonplace, but give me the rude mountain scramble, the roving haphazard wayfaring, the frank hospitable though half-wild manners that give such a true game flavor to romantic Spain. Our first evening's entertainment had a relish of the kind. We arrived after sunset at a little town among the hills, after a fatiguing journey over a wide, houseless plain, where we had been repeatedly drenched with showers. In the inn were quartered a party of miguelistas, who were patrolling the country in pursuit of robbers. The appearance of foreigners like ourselves was unusual in this remote town. Mine host, with two or three old gossiping comrades in brown cloaks, studied our passports in the corner of the posada, while an alguazil took notes by the dim light of a lamp. The passports were in foreign languages and perplexed them, but our squire Sancho assisted them in their studies and magnified our importance with the grandiloquence of a Spaniard. In the meantime, the magnificent distribution of a few cigars had won the hearts of all around us. In a little while, the whole community seemed put in agitation to make us welcome. The corregidor himself waited upon us, and a great rush-bottomed armed chair was ostentatiously bolstered into our room by our landlady for the accommodation of that important personage. The commander of the patrol took supper with us, a surly, talking, laughing, swaggering Andalus, who had made a campaign in South America, and recounted his exploits in love and war with much pomp of praise and vehemence of gesticulation and mysterious rolling of the eye. He told us he had a list of all the robbers in the country and meant to ferret out every mother's son of them. He offered us, at the same time, some of his soldiers as an escort. One is enough to protect you, signors. The robbers know me, and know my men. The sight of one is enough to spread terror through a whole Sierra. We thanked him for his offer, but assured him, in his own strain, that with the protection of our redoubtable squire Sancho, we were not afraid of all the ladrones of Andalusia. While we were supping with our Andalusian friend, we heard the notes of a guitar and the click of castanets, and presently a chorus of voices singing a popular air. In fact, mine host had gathered together the amateur singers and musicians, and the rustic bells of the neighborhood, and on going forth the courtyard of the inn presented a scene of true Spanish festivity. 
we took our seats with mine host and hostess and the commander of the patrol under the archway of the court the guitar passed from hand to hand but a jovial shoemaker was the orpheus of the place he was a pleasant-looking fellow with huge black whiskers and a roguish eye his sleeves were rolled up to his elbows he touched the guitar with masterly skill and sang little amorous ditties with an expressive leer at the women with whom he was evidently a favorite he afterwards danced a fandango with a buxom andalusian damsel to the great delight of the spectators but none of the females present could compare with mine host's pretty daughter josefa who had slipped away and made her toilette for the occasion and had adorned her head with roses and also distinguished herself in a bolero with a handsome young dragoon we had ordered our host to let wine and refreshment circulate freely among the company yet though there was a motley assemblage of soldiers muleteers and villagers no one exceeded the bounds of sober enjoyment the scene was a study for a painter the picturesque group of dancers the troopers in their half-military dresses the peasantry wrapped in their brown cloaks nor must i omit the mention of the old meagre alguazil in a short black cloak who took no notice of anything going on but sat in a corner diligently writing by the dim light of a huge copper lamp that might have figured in the days of don quixote i am not writing a regular narrative and do not pretend to give the varied events of several days rambling over hill and dale and moor and mountain we travelled in true contrabandista style taking everything rough and smooth as we found it and mingling with all classes and conditions in a kind of vagabond companionship it is the true way to travel in spain knowing the scanty larders of the inns and the naked tracts of country the traveller has often to traverse we had taken care on starting to have the alforjas or saddle-bags of our squire well stocked with cold provisions and his beta or leathern bottle which was of portly dimensions filled to the neck with choice valdepenas wine as this was a munition for our campaign more important than even his trabuco we exhorted him to have an eye to it and i will do him the justice to say that his namesake the trencher-loving sancho himself could not excel him as a provident purveyor though the alforjas and beta were repeatedly and vigorously assailed throughout the journey they appeared to have a miraculous property of being never empty for our vigilant squire took care to sack everything that remained from our evening repasts at the inns to supply our next day's luncheon what luxurious noontime repasts have we made on the greensward by the side of a brook or fountain under a shady tree and then what delicious siestas on our cloaks spread out on the herbage we paused one day at noon for a repast of the kind it was in a pleasant little green meadow surrounded by hills covered with olive trees our cloaks were spread on the grass under an elm tree by the side of a babbling rivulet our horses were tethered where they might crop the herbage and sancho produced his alforjas with an air of triumph they contained the contributions of four days journeying but had been signally enriched by the foraging of the previous evening in a plenteous inn at antajera our squire drew forth the heterogeneous contents one by one and they seemed to have no end first came forth a shoulder of roasted kid very little the worse for wear then an entire partridge then a great morsel of salted codfish wrapped in paper 
then the residue of a ham, then the half of a pullet, together with several rolls of bread, and a rabble root of oranges, figs, raisins, and walnuts. His beta also had been recruited with some excellent wine of Malaga. At every fresh apparition from his larder, he could enjoy our ludicrous surprise, throwing himself back on the grass and shouting with laughter. Nothing pleased this simple-hearted varlet more than to be compared for his devotion to the trencher, to the renowned squire of Don Quixote. He was well versed in the history of the Don, and, like most of the common people of Spain, he firmly believed it to be a true history. "'All that, however, happened a long time ago, Signor,' said he to me one day, with an inquiring look. "'A very long time.' was the reply. I dare say more than a thousand years, still looking dubiously. I dare say, not less. The squire was satisfied. As we were making our repast above described, and diverting ourselves with the simple drollery of our squire, a solitary beggar approached us, who had almost the look of a pilgrim. He was evidently very old, with a grey beard, and supported himself on a staff, yet age had not borne him down. He was tall and erect, and had the wreck of a fine form. He wore a round Andalusian hat, a sheepskin jacket, and leathern breeches, gaiters, and sandals. His dress, though old and patched, was decent, his demeanour manly, and he addressed us with that grave courtesy that is to be remarked in the lowest Spaniard. We were in a favourable mood for such a visitor, and in a freak of capricious charity gave him some silver, a loaf of fine wheaten bread, and a goblet of our choice wine of Malaga. He received them thankfully, but without any grovelling tribute of gratitude. Tasting the wine, he held it up to the light, with a slight beam of surprise in his eye. Then, quaffing it off at a draught, "'It is many years,' said he, "'since I have tasted such wine. It is a cordial to an old man's heart.' Then, looking at the beautiful wheaten loaf, "'Bendita sea tal pan!' Blessed be such bread. So saying, he put it in his wallet. We urged him to eat it on the spot. Oh, no, signors, replied he, the wine I had to drink or leave, but the bread I must take home to share with my family. Our man Sancho sought our eye, and reading permission there, gave the old man some of the ample fragments of our repast, on condition, however, that he should sit down and make a meal. He accordingly took his seat at some little distance from us, and began to eat, slowly and with a sobriety and decorum that would have become a hidalgo. There was altogether a measured manner and a quiet self-possession about the old man that made me think he had seen better days. His language, too, though simple, had occasionally something picturesque and almost poetical in the phraseology. I set him down for some broken-down cavalier. I was mistaken. It was nothing but the innate courtesy of a Spaniard, and the poetical turn of thought and language often to be found in the lowest classes of this clear-witted people. For fifty years, he told us, he had been a shepherd, but now he was out of employ and destitute. When I was a young man, said he, nothing could harm or trouble me. I was always well, always gay, but now I am seventy-nine years of age, and a beggar, and my heart begins to fail me. Still, he was not a regular mendicant. It was not until recently that want had driven him to this degradation, and he gave a touching picture of the struggle between hunger and pride when abject destitution first came upon him. He was returning from Malaga without money. He had not tasted food for some time, 
and was crossing one of the great plains of Spain, where there were but few habitations. When almost dead with hunger, he applied at the door of a vanta, or country inn. Perdona usted per Dios, hermano. Excuse us, brother, for God's sake, was the reply, the usual mode in Spain of refusing a beggar. I turned away, said he, with shame greater than my hunger, for my heart was yet too proud. I came to a river with high banks and deep rapid current, and felt tempted to throw myself in. What should such an old, worthless, wretched man as I live for? But when I was on the brink of the current, I thought on the Blessed Virgin and turned away. I travelled on until I saw a country seat at a little distance from the road, and entered the outer gate of the courtyard. The door was shut, but there were two young signoras at a window. I approached and begged. Perdona usted per Dios, hermano. Excuse us, brother, for God's sake, and the window closed. I crept out of the courtyard, but hunger overcame me, and my heart gave way. I thought my hour was at hand. So I laid myself down at the gate, commended myself to the Holy Virgin, and covered my head to die. In a little while afterwards, the master of the house came home. Seeing me lying at his gate, he uncovered my head, had pity on my gray hairs, took me into his house, and gave me food. So, signors, you see that we should always put confidence in the protection of the Virgin. The old man was on his way to his native place, Arshitona, which was close by the summit of a steep and rugged mountain. He pointed to the ruins of its old Moorish castle. That castle, he said, was inhabited by a Moorish king at the time of the wars of Granada. Queen Isabella invaded it with a great army, but the king looked down from his castle among the clouds and laughed her to scorn. Upon this the virgin appeared to the queen and guided her and her army up a mysterious path of the mountain which had never before been known. When the moor saw her coming he was astonished and springing with his horse from a precipice was dashed to pieces. The marks of his horse's hoofs, said the old man, are to be seen on the margin of the rock to this day. And see, signors, yonder is the road by which the queen and her army mounted. You see it like a ribbon up the mountainside. But the miracle is that though it can be seen at a distance, when you come near it disappears. The ideal road to which he pointed was evidently a sandy ravine of the mountain, which looked narrow and defined at a distance, but became broad and indistinct on an approach. As the old man's heart warmed with wine and wassail, he went on to tell us a story of the buried treasure left under the earth by the Moorish king. His own house was next to the foundations of the castle. The curate and notary dreamt three times of the treasure, and went to work at the place pointed out in their dreams. His own son-in-law heard the sound of their pickaxes and spades at night. What they found nobody knows. They became suddenly rich, but kept their own secret. Thus the old man had once been next door to fortune, but was doomed never to get under the same roof. I have remarked that the stories of treasure buried by the Moors, which prevail throughout Spain, are most current among the poorest people. It is thus kind nature consoles with shadows for the lack of substantials. The thirsty man dreams of fountains and roaring streams, the hungry man of ideal banquets, and the poor man of heaps of hidden gold. Nothing certainly is more magnificent than the imagination of a beggar. The last travelling sketch which I shall give is a curious scene at the little city of Loja. This was a famous belligerent frontier post 
in the time of the Moors, and repulsed Ferdinand from its walls. It was the stronghold of old Ali Attar, the father-in-law of Boabdil. When that fiery veteran sallied forth with his son-in-law on that disastrous inroad that ended in the death of the chieftain and the capture of the monarch. Loja is wildly situated in a broken mountain pass on the banks of the Hinil, among rocks and groves and meadows and gardens. The people seem still to retain the bold, fiery spirit of the olden time. Our inn was suited to the place. It was kept by a young, handsome Andalusian widow, whose trim busquina of black silk fringed with bugles, set off the play of a graceful form and round, pliant limbs. Her step was firm and elastic, her dark eye was full of fire, and the coquetry of her air and various ornaments of her person showed that she was accustomed to be admired. She was well matched by a brother, nearly about her own age. They were perfect models of the Andalusian Maho and Maha. He was tall, vigorous, and well-formed, with a clear olive complexion, a dark beaming eye, and curling chestnut whiskers that met under his chin. He was gallantly dressed in a short green velvet jacket, fitted to his shape, profusely decorated with silver buttons, with a white handkerchief in each pocket. He had breeches of the same, with rows of buttons from the hips to the knees, a pink silk handkerchief round his neck, gathered through a ring on the bosom of a neatly plaited shirt, a sash around the waist to match, botinas or spatterdashes of the finest russet leather, elegantly worked and open at the calves to show his stockings, and russet shoes setting off a well-shaped foot. As he was standing at the door, a horseman rode up and entered into low and earnest conversation with him. He was dressed in similar style, and almost with equal finery. A man about thirty, square-built, with strong Roman features, handsome, though slightly pitted with the smallpox, with a free, bold, and somewhat daring air. His powerful black horse was decorated with tassels and fanciful trappings, and a couple of broad-mouthed blunderbusses hung behind the saddle. He had the air of those contrabandistas that I have seen in the mountains of Ronda, and evidently had a good understanding with the brother of mine hostess. Nay, if I mistake not, he was a favorite admirer of the widow. In fact, the whole inn and its inmates had something of a contrabandista aspect, and the blunderbuss stood in a corner beside the guitar. The horseman I have mentioned passed his evenings in the posada, and sang several bold mountain romances with great spirit. As we were at supper, two poor Asturians put in in distress, begging food and a night's lodging. They had been waylaid by robbers as they came from a fair among the mountains, robbed of a horse which carried all their stock in trade stripped of their money and most of their apparel, beaten for having offered resistance, and left almost naked on the road. My companion, with a prompt generosity natural to him, ordered them a supper and a bed, and gave them a supply of money to help them forward towards their home. As the evening advanced, the dramatis personae thickened. A large man, about sixty years of age, of powerful frame, came strolling in to gossip with mine hostess. He was dressed in the ordinary Andalusian costume, but had a huge sabre tucked under his arm, wore large moustaches, and had something of a lofty, swaggering air. Everyone seemed to regard him with great deference. Our man Sancho, whispered to us that he was Don Ventura Rodriguez, the hero and champion of Roja, famous for his prowess and the strength of his arm. 
In the time of the French invasion he surprised six troopers who were asleep. He first secured their horses, then attacked them with his sabre, killed some, and took the rest prisoners. For this exploit the king allows him a peseta, the fifth of a duro or dollar, per day, and has dignified him with the title of Don. I was amused to notice his swelling language and demeanor. He was evidently a thorough Andalusian, boastful as he was brave. His sabre was always in his hand or under his arm. He carries it always about him as a child does a doll, calls it his Santa Teresa, and says that when he draws it, tembla la tierra, the earth trembles. I sat until a late hour listening to the varied themes of this motley group, who mingled together with the unreserve of a Spanish posada. We had contrabandista songs, stories of robbers, guerrilla exploits, and Moorish legends. The last one from our handsome landlady, who gave a poetical account of the infernos, or infernal regions of Loja, dark caverns in which subterraneous streams and waterfalls make a mysterious sound. The common people say they are money coiners shut up there from the time of the Moors, and that the Moorish kings kept their treasures in these caverns. Were it the purport of this work, I could fill its pages with the incidents and scenes of our rambling expedition, but other themes invite me. Journeying in this manner, we at length emerged from the mountains and entered upon the beautiful Vega of Granada. Here we took our last midday's repast under a grove of olive trees on the borders of a rivulet, with the old Moorish capital in the distance, dominated by the ruddy towers of the Alhambra, while far above it the snowy summits of the Sierra Nevada shone like silver. The day was without a cloud, and the heat of the sun tempered by cool breezes from the mountains. After our repast, we spread our cloaks and took our last siesta, lulled by the humming of bees among the flowers and the notes of the ring doves from the neighboring olive trees. When the sultry hours were past, we resumed our journey, and after passing between hedges of aloes and Indian figs, and through a wilderness of gardens, arrived about sunset at the gates of Granada. End of chapter 1